it's going to show us on the attacks on block wise two local DRGs that switch all the server and then change the stock. Thanks, Rosario. And, uh, and everyone else, Shai, Dad, Dal, everyone else who invited me. Uh, so this is uh, an attack on uh, on one of the constructions that uh, one of Rachel and Stepanov's theorems, uh, namely the, con the the conjecture construction of I/O from bilinear maps and sort of certain PRGs. This is work with Alex, who is ah, raise your hand. Okay, good. All right, excellent. Okay, so uh, so Rachel told you a great deal about uh, sort of obfuscation, the whole history. I don't want to go too much into it. Uh, but just want to say, you know, this is uh, this is the oldest, one of the oldest quests in sort of modern cryptography. We're running the scholar from sort of Diffie and Hellman, who, you know, if you read carefully uh, their 1976 paper, they say, you know, here is a way to construct public encryption from secret encryption, just obfuscate the encryption algorithm. It took a long time to formalize it. Uh, it took a long time to even more long, uh, even longer to come up with the candidate construction, uh, and that's. Uh, Several people here: Garth, Gentry, Halevi, Mankova, Shatai, and Waters, for an appropriate formalization called I/O. Um, then the, there's the quest of sort of coming up with uh, sort of the underlying mathematics that actually makes this potentially secure. And then there's the quest of actually trying to prove uh, that constructions of I/O are actually secure uh, under well-defined assumptions on the underlying mathematical objects. Let's say the Diffie-Hellman assumption on uh, 25 linear maps or whatever. So, so this again is a is yet another long road. Uh, several works that uh, that that kind of started this process off. At some point, uh, you know, uh, there was this pair of works: one with uh, Neil and another one with uh, Prabhanjan and uh, and uh, Abhishek, uh, that said, uh, look, you know, to construct uh, indistinguishability obfuscation, it uh, suffices to construct something called functional encryption, or what's called compact functional encryption, which has been studied for a little longer. Uh, so hopefully, that makes our life easier. And that sort of is the path that all the sort of subsequent constructions took, as far as I know. In particular, there's a, yet another sort of compressed sequence of results that leads to sort of uh, Rachel and Stepanov's work, uh, where you um, sort of you know you successfully reduced the sort of the multilinearity required of these uh, these maps. At this point, we have three, uh, and that's uh, the work of Rachel, uh, and the work of uh, Prabhanjan and Tamit under slightly different sort of assumptions. Uh, and then there is the bilinear map uh, candidate. Right? So, uh, uh, so, so uh, it's a theorem that uh, three linear maps plus locality three, blockwise locality three PRG suffice. Then theorem two that says uh, bilinear maps plus blockwise locality two PRG suffice. As you make the degree of the multilinear map smaller, they become easier to achieve. As you make the locality of the PRG smaller, they become harder to achieve. So there is a little bit of a tug of war going on. Right? So that is it. That is that is that you know seemed like the end of the line, uh, right? Or is it? Right. So for uh, for two weeks, uh, it really did seem like the like really the end of the line. We are done. Might as well go home, retire. You know, depending on your you know uh, your profession. Uh, so what are these two theorems? Uh, right, so the first theorem says that, uh, as Rachel told you just now, uh, that there is an I/O scheme, assuming that uh, there are three linear maps, which I'm now going to define, but these are objects, uh, and uh, something called three Q blockwise local PRGs exist. I'm going to define that in a second. Three refers to the fact that each output bit depends on three blocks or symbols in the input alphabet. And Q refers to the size of the input alphabet. Right? This is two to the power block length in Rachel's language. Okay, so that was great. So what is, you know, how do I parse this? Well, three linear maps, we don't have very good candidates at this point, right? Uh, you know, there are approximate multilinear maps of Garg, Gentry, and Halevi, uh, but they're not multilinear maps. They are approximate multilinear maps. On the other hand, these three blockwise local PRGs, we have candidate constructions with you know, you know, you know, meaningful security arguments, namely things that say certain classes of attacks cannot work against these constructions. So, blue refers to the fact that we believe this assumption more than the red one. Okay, that's what it is. 
The second theorem is a dramatic reversal of this of this state of affairs, right? So, so at that point, I was like, uh, local three local PRGs, no problem. You know, they are all over the place. At least there is one. Okay, um, uh, you know, but three linear maps, heaven knows. Um, the second theorem says really it's the opposite. It's a, it sort of completely reverses the state of affairs. It says, you know, here's a construction from two linear or bilinear maps and two local, blockwise two local PRGs. So which one do you believe more? Bilinear maps, no problem. You know, until since uh, Zhu, uh, Bonnet, Franklin, we, we've been playing with these things uh, for like 15 years, no problem. That exists. What does or does not exist, what is in question is blockwise to local PRGs. Right, so, so in, a, in a matter of uh, a couple of days, the, the state of affairs completely reversed in this, or the existence of, so now the existence of I.O. was predicated on some PRG strange assumption, nothing to do with uh, sort of multilinear maps. So very, uh, very interesting state of affairs. Um, uh, so, so, so Rachel, I think, showed uh, that, you know, so what matters in these things is locality and also expansion. So these things are related to each other, as Daniel pointed out. Um, she needed PRGs that expand from n bits to n times q to the three bits. Q is the alphabet size. So, so I'm going to define all these things formally. Just keep this in mind. Uh, so this was sort of uh, like an artifact of the construction. But really, the minimum stretch there is a there is such a thing as a minimum stretch of the PRG that is necessary for Rachel and Stefano's construction, and that is anything more than n times q. Q is the alphabet size, and she will pre-process the log Q bits into Q bits, compute all monomials, right? So she makes n times log Q bits into n times Q bits by pre-processing. And the PRG had better expand from that to something bigger, otherwise you're getting nothing out of this whole process. Okay, so n times Q to the one plus epsilon bits is necessary, yes? So you're saying like in the result they needed three, but the three you could hope to remove. But One could hope to remove. We don't know how to remove it at this point, but this is the absolute bare bottom okay. minimum, right? That's what I'm saying. Yeah, so, so that's that's what the state of affairs is. So this state of affairs really made me into a CSP person uh, for a week. Uh, not a CSP person, I was just reading things. Not me, really, it was Alex that was reading things, but you know what I mean, right? Uh, for a week I was doing nothing but but uh, obsessing about CSPs for heaven's sake, you know, uh, completely, yeah. Okay, so in any case, the result of uh, this talk is that uh, this theorem 2, the construction, the assumption B in theorem 2 is broken. Okay, so let me define what these creatures are, and then we'll do the attack. It's a really simple talk, you know, simulatable with a few bits of, uh, of information, maybe simulatable with no bits for some people in the, in the audience. Okay. That's the talk. Okay, so what is local PRGs? Rachel already told you. So this is an object that was uh, sort of defined at least uh, explicitly so in, uh, yes, Dobby. What exactly is broken? Um, I'll state the theorem formally. Uh, it is not the end of the story. Sorry? We will get there. It's a, it's a, it's a, the answer is it's complicated. We'll get there, okay? Hold on for a couple slides. Let me first define things. Uh, local PRGs, you know what it is. Odin Goldreich, thank you very much. He sort of uh, defined this creature. Um, um, you know, these are PRGs where we have n input bits and m output bits. Rachel, you know, uh, confused you by putting the input bits at the bottom and the output at the top. I am straightening things out. <laughs> 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 this is the way it should be. <laughs> so, n input bits, m output bits, and each uh, input bit. Um, you know, it depends on L. Uh, each output bit depends on L input bits, so you have a hyper edge between uh, sort of L input bits. Uh, and it depends in what sense, so the output bit is computed by restricting the input to these, uh, these guys and applying a certain predicate um, uh, to, these, uh, to these input bits. Okay, so, so yeah, I mean, that's all clear. Um, so this object is defined by two things. One, the hypergraph that says which bits each output bit, which bits does it depend on? Which input bits does it depend on? And two, the predicate. Which predicate do you apply to this restriction of these bits to get the output bit? Two things you need to keep in mind. Okay, so that's local PRGs. What is a blockwise local PRG? So LQ blockwise local PRG is again the same picture, exact same picture. Each uh, output bit depends on L star things 
in the in the input, except that the things here are ZQL, are you know elements that come from a certain sort of. Uh, don't think about ZQ as a group or anything of the form. It's just a sort of a universe of size Q. That's it. Right? So, so, so log Q is the block length in Rachel's language. Yeah, that's that. Why not? I mean, you can you can you can do whatever you want. You know, you can, why the, why should the inputs be bits? You know, they could be uh, blocks. Yeah. That's that's a blockwise local PLG. Um, so what do we know about these things? You know, so so Oded's uh, Oded Goldreich's uh, uh, PLG candidate for different uh, sort of instantiations, locality, and so forth has been studied fairly well. Um, by people studying CSPs, other people, uh, we know a lot of things about, about these candidates. Let me focus on two locality at this point. Okay, larger, we know several things, but that's not the point of this talk. Um, okay, so for two, yeah, what do you do, right? Uh, what can a predicate on two bits be? It could either be uh, an unbalanced predicate, in which case each output bit is biased, you know, it's completely insecure as a PLG. Or it could be x1 or x2, right? P of x1, x2 is x1 or is x2 or x1 complement or x2 complement. Again, broken as long as it stretches one bit more than uh, more than n. Or it's xor or the opposite of the xor. Again, do Gaussian elimination, you're, you're good. No problem. This is completely trivial, right? Yeah. Oh, with me? Good. Turns out that you can actually break it in an even stronger sense. Right. Not only is it broken, it's really like a hammer on the head, right? It's broken. In particular, there's a notion of strongly breaking a PRG, uh, which says the following. So what does breaking a PRG mean? I, I want an algorithm that given the output of the PRG says one thing, and given a random string says another thing with a certain gap. What I want by strongly breaking is I want to distinguish between a random string and a string that is close to the output of the PRG in having this half plus epsilon close to the PLG output versus random, strongly breaking. So this is related to something called strong refutation in the, uh, in the CSP literature, as I learned, newly found knowledge. Okay, so this again is possible. I mean, strongly refuting is possible. Uh, the tricky thing is the XOR. Uh, the only tricky thing is really the XOR. Uh, and that, uh, again, you know, if you uh, go back to Gomez Williamson, you know, go through the sequence of results that they basically show that uh, you can actually break this um, as long as it stretches something like n over epsilon squared. So you want a half plus epsilon strongly break the PRG, you need stretch that grows as n over epsilon squared. Epsilon smaller, stretch larger. Yeah, does that make sense? Yeah, so this is, this is, this is what, uh, what we know. Okay, and this strongly breaking will become very relevant to us, very important to us as we go along in a second. How about breaking blockwise local PRGs? Right? Two Q, again, the locality is two. Again, each output bit depends on two things in the input. Now the things happen to be blocks, not bits. So what do we know about it? Again, the sequence of results, uh, perhaps the most relevant is the work of uh, Alan, Brian O'Donnell, and Whitmer um, from a couple of years ago. And they show that uh, for random graphs, for random sort of uh, you know, graphs that define the, the PRG, and for any predicate, uh, you can break this PRG, any PRG, PRG defined by any such predicate, you can break it as long as m is uh, uh, omega n, slightly more than n, as usual, uh, times polynomial in the, in the block size, uh, polynomial in the alphabet size, q. Right? Remember again, alphabet size is 2 to the block length. Right? As long as uh, m is n times some polynomial in q, we tried well, maybe Alex tried to look into what this polynomial is. What is it? It's some, some, some strange polynomial. We never could really figure out what this number is. Uh, it was a large constant. Some polynomial in Q. That's it. They also show how to strongly break uh, a blockwise local PRG uh, with that kind of stretch. It's so again n times some ugly polynomial in Q divided by epsilon squared. So again, remember what is strongly breaking? We want to distinguish between random strings and any string that is uh, half plus epsilon close to a PRG. So there's an algorithm that on any string that's half plus epsilon close to a PRG, it'll say yes or no. Uh, and uh, random strings, it'll say uh, the other answer with high probability. That's what you want. OK, that they show. They show. The only, yeah. 
because it's a because it's a it's a I'm taking it for uh, for two. Uh, it does depend on the locality. In fact, it is n to the l over two, n to the l over two. In fact, it's even better. It's that ah, never mind. Why why should I give away all that I learned you know uh, for free? Ah, doesn't make sense. <laughs> two. Okay, <laughs> this is for it. Uh, no, there are two things. One is a random graph, uh, and the other one is uh, the n times poly cube. So we want to break the PLG uh, when m is n times q cubed plus epsilon, right? That's what uh, that's the stretch. That, it's a minimum stretch that Rachel's theorem, Rachel and Stefano's theorem means. So there's a one plus epsilon and the n. It's like, like why right? you get n to the one plus epsilon? No, no, I don't think so. I mean, uh, if I wrote it. This is good enough, yeah. So, so n times q is really the minimal, and the one plus epsilon, yeah, anything more than that, you're you're good, all right. But you're saying this theorem would already break one plus epsilon, but not the like just n times q. Q is a pretty good polynomial epsilon. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah, yeah. Oh, polynomial n, sorry. Polynomial n, yeah. It's strange. Oh, I see. <laughs> okay. Okay. <laughs> um, Yes. Good. So we need this polynomial to be uh, uh, small to to break um, um, Rachel and Stefano's theorem, and there could be a conceivable extension of Rachel and Stefano's theorem that only needs even smaller stretch, something like n times q to the one plus epsilon, uh, and you know that you'd really need like that theorem to be as strong as uh, it gets to break that. Okay, so that's why it doesn't work yet for us. So what do we show? Uh, I'm going to tell you what our results are, but I'm going to also tell you uh, about uh, concurrent work of uh, Boaz, uh, Zika, Ilan, and Farish. Um, um, so we both came up with uh, results which were used uh, in different, completely different techniques um, uh, and um, showed different theorems. Uh, and eventually, it turns out you can put these things together to show the best of both worlds. So I'll tell you all these uh, the whole sequence. Okay, so our first theorem uh, was that uh, you can break um, um, two local, two blockwise, two q blockwise local PRGs uh, with stretch n times q, which is sort of the minimal, um, uh, where the predicate is anything you want. I don't care, uh, but the graph is random. So in some sense, it's like the Allen, O'Donnell, Whitmer theorem. That's where we inherit the random graph from. This breaks the uh, PLG that uh, Rachel and Stefano need for random graphs. Boaz et al. showed that uh, uh, two, two theorems, forget the second line, I'm just putting it there for just one. The third line says that uh, it doesn't matter what the predicate is, it doesn't matter what the graph is, I can break the PLG as long as the stretch is n times q squared omega tilde n times q squared. So that already breaks uh, Rachel and Stefano's theorem for any graph, any predicate, whatever. Right. Turns out that uh, you know, these techniques, the techniques we use to prove our theorem and uh, Boas uh, theorem are com so complementary that you can put them together, you can get the best of both worlds. You can actually break any predicate, any graph with the, in some sense, the minimal stretch uh, necessary for, um, for Rachel and Stefano. For, for a possible extension of Rachel and Stefano's theorem. Okay, so that's that. So is it is it all done, right? I mean, are we, uh, you know, bullet on the head, right? Uh, you know, is it, all, is it all done? Turns out not entirely. Uh, there is another variable that I did not tell you about, um, and that is whether each output bit depends on, you know, is, is computed as the same predicate applied on the inputs or arbitrary different predicates applied on the inputs. So line three, which is Boaz's result, really breaks Rachel and Stefano's theorem. It says, really, predicate can be anything could be different for uh, each output bit. The graph could be anything. As long as it stretches n times q squared, you're good. You can, you can, as in the theorem is broken. What is not broken is sort of the minimal stretch and all the other parameters, like worst case graphs, worst case predicates, and arbitrary predicates for each output bit. This is one sort of data point uh, that is not yet broken. So what does that mean in practice? It means if Rachel and Stefano had only worked harder, uh, 
hint. <laughs> no. uh, if they had uh, proved the theorem with even smaller stretch, like n times q to the 1 plus epsilon, uh, and they could come up with you know, PRGs that, uh, that fit into this, this mold, you know, candidate PRGs that fit into this mold, uh, then maybe light, there is light at the end, end of the tunnel. Uh, but in reality, I, I don't think there is light at the end of the tunnel. Perhaps someone here can put us out of the mess very quickly. Yeah. So the, the, the bottom line is, the bottom line is should read any true blockwise PRG, right? Uh, no. The, the bottom line says if there exists. No, no, but this is a completely generic. Um, uh, yes. Two, two block PRG. Yes, yes, yes. yes. What it does or no, 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 no. no. Yeah, so that again, we, uh, you mean like a random graph and the arbitrary different priority states. So that again, I don't know how to attack. And if you think about trying to come up with these explicit uh, choices of the either predicate or graph, then maybe the other is wrong. Well, um, I didn't. That depends on whether you believe in it. You, you try to prove a theorem if you believe in it, right? Uh, I don't believe in the theorem, so I didn't try very hard. But it's a good question. It's a good question. Are there heuristic attacks? Like if you didn't care about sort of Come up with candidate predicates and try to break it, right? So that's a, that's a reasonable thing to do. Ah, ah. So, okay, so, so this, so this, good, good, good. So, so this was attacked using uh, sort of one week of CSP knowledge, essentially. So if you had a year of CSP knowledge, I'm sure people can. So it's essentially use like SDP uh, sort of techniques, you know, souped up SDP techniques. I'm sure there is something that one can do. It's just that I don't know how to do it. Ah. So that, I don't know. I, I'm, yeah, I, I don't know. It's a good question. I don't know. Well, then again, I should say, you know, I never believed in, uh, in uh, I.O. from bilinear maps, uh, but there was one, and it required reasonable effort to actually refute it, so my beliefs are probably not worth much. Um, you never believed in I.O. from bilinear maps? I heard you say in the talk that you believed in it. That was never recorded. <laughs> so, um, so, so, <laughs> I did not sign the, uh, so, uh, so Boaz also shows a uh, stronger theorem. This paper does more. Uh, they actually uh, break uh, PRGs where the predicates are not small localities with, with small degree. So they, they really show more results. Uh, but I don't know sort of uh, cryptographic applications of this, so I'm not going to discuss it further. Also because I don't know what it is. OK, so, so let me show sort of the main sort of idea of our theorem, uh, which is sort of one technique, which I'll call alphabet reduction. Uh, and the idea is that, uh, look, you know, if the, look at the um, Alan O'Donnell Whitmer theorem, right? I mean, the only thing that's standing between you, between me, and, uh, and a break is the fact that, that the theorem depends on the alphabet size with a rather large polynomial. So what I want to show, what, what alphabet reduction does, is it reduces breaking this blockwise local PRG to breaking a PRG that really like a pure local PRG, you know, the ones where the inputs are bits. Right? That would be amazing if we could show it. We can't quite show it. We can only show that if you can strongly break a PRG where the inputs are bits, then you can break uh, PRG where um, the inputs are blocks. That's what alphabet reduction does. Okay, so it makes sense, right? And here is a theorem. Here's a lemma. Um, so here's a key lemma. So uh, and this again was a lemma that was known for a very long time. It's not very hard to prove. Um, uh, and what this says is, take any predicate P that works on ZQ times ZQ, takes two symbols from alphabets of size Q. I can come up with uh, another predicate P prime that I can write in the following way. The P prime takes e you know, each of the two input symbols by itself, applies some function on it that outputs it. F and G are the functions that they output individually on X and Y, and these functions output single bits. And then put a Q on top of each, uh, on top of it, a Q that takes two bits and outputs a bit. Right? So you can decompose 
complex predicate P into such a simple predicate, one where you know I act on my bit, you act on your bit, you, you I act on my symbol, you act on your symbol, I'll put bits, and then you put the bits together to get something. So clearly not every predicate can be written in this form, but what you can show is that every predicate can be approximated by a predicate of this form. Namely, this predicate P prime is reasonably correlated uh, to P. It's one half plus one over square root Q correlated to P. Something you can show. And this is not a hard uh, theorem, and uh, here's a teaser, uh, you know, for Evgeny. <laughs> So my Facebook feed is full of puzzles with it from Eugeni, so I'm going to get back at him. <laughs> so here it is. So, so, so here is the theorem, which has apparently nothing to do with anything here, uh, which is that uh, show that every two-source extractor that acts on n bits and uh, you know, even for sort of min entropy n minus 1 uh, has L, which is not trivial. It's not 2 to the minus n. It's actually at least 2 to the minus n over 2. That's 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 uh, that's a teaser, and it, it'll become apparent why this is really what we want, un unless it's already apparent. Okay, so this is what uh, this is what we need. So why why does this? Sorry. Yeah, yeah, but for, for for two source, right? I mean, you have you have uh, two uh, you have two strings of n bits each. So naively, I would expect two to the minus n. But I can only get two to the minus n over two. So it's not hard at all, but it's not entirely trivial. It's not like super trivial. This is like you, it's not strong. It's not super no, not strong to this part. Yeah, yeah. Don't ask me questions about it. <laughs> I'll, I'll come back to it uh, later. Um, okay. So given this, what do you do? Right. So think about the following. Here's the attack. Think about the following mental experiment. Uh, you have uh, this PRG, this is the PRG that we have been talking about. The inputs are blocks and the outputs are bits. And I'm going to label each edge uh, by, well, this is a hyper edge, right? I mean, uh, it matters whether what my first input is and what my second input is. It's asymmetric, right? So that's why I labeled it as one and two. So what do I want to do? I want to uh, think about this as a composition of two functions, one that translates blocks into bits, like take each block and makes it into a bit, and then sort of you know a local function, bitwise local function that acts on these, these bits. That's what I want to do. Right, so the first one is f and g somehow apply to the, that, and q applies to this. So can I do this? Uh, it turns out you can, not, not very hard again. Uh, you can partition your input bits into uh, two parts. Uh, one that you apply f to to reduce it into a bit. The other one that you apply g to to reduce into a bit. Um, and, and, and what is the only problem? The only problem is constraints that depend on two variables, two f variables, or two g variables, or the first one depends on a g variable and the second one depends on an f variable. All these things I cannot sort of handle using uh, this composition. Right? So, so think about this composition. What, what am I doing? To these green variables, I'm applying f to them. The yellow variables, I'm applying g to them. So any constraint whose first input is a, is a green variable and the second input is a yellow variable, I can, this is what, it computes this guy, approximately. So does yeah. f and g not compute necessarily? Do you have where do you need the decomposition? So yeah. do you have like a triangle or something? You need to compartition so that for every pair you kind of respect I do have to respect every uh, every constraint, right? So so I can actually throw away some of these constraints that uh, if that that's what you're asking. I can I can actually afford to throw away some of the constraints. In fact, I'll throw away only a constant fraction of the constraints. No problem. Right. Need a little bit more work to show this, but uh, so at the end, what we get is that if our output candidate output Z, which is what comes out of the thing and what we are given and we have to distinguish. That guy is random with respect to the old predicate P. It is with respect to this new with, uh, P prime. Clearly, right? it's random. There's nothing to do with anything else. If Z is an output of P, it is close to an output of P prime. That's number two. Now, close comes from the fact that P prime is correlated. It's not, it doesn't compute P exactly. It's correlated to output P. OK, so that's, what, that's, what, that's where we are. Oh, dead. The, the, yes, but so so so. Yeah. So 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 the point is that uh, 
you know, um, really So uh, the, the, the ELG breaking algorithm is, uh, is, a, is, is even stronger than what I said, meaning that for any string that is half minus epsilon, half plus epsilon close uh, to an output of the PLG, the guy will say yes. So I don't have to deal with correlations of the thing. Yes, so, so, so we use the Russian slab, all three Russian slab, not including it. Salut, salut. Um, does the lemma guarantee that F and G are balanced, or? Yeah. Okay. There you go. <laughs> yes. Uh, the warning for six, can it be with F and a G another time? Say again. The warning for six, which is called, your F and A, and your composite Yeah. No, no, they, so, so each constraint that survives this process, because I did throw away one constraint, if you, if you saw what that is. Yeah, so the one for the green one be yellow for another pair? Um, every constraint that survives has sort of in green, yellow. So the first input, the first so thing that it reads. change a red to a color, it can't be changed to a different color. No. All right, okay, fine. So now we are in a scenario uh, where our alphabet size is uh, constant, in fact, two. Um, and uh, our epsilon, so we want to strongly refute, strongly uh, break this PLG, uh, where the epsilon is uh, one over square root two. If you look back at uh, the Alan O'Donnell Whitmore theorem, they, have, they, they, they did something terrible about the, about the alphabet size, polynomial and q, q to the eight or whatever. But they did something very nice about the one over epsilon. It's one over epsilon squared, right? So if you plug this into the theorem, you really get uh, n times q. You really get a break for the PRG when, as long as it stretches by omega tilde n times q, some polynomial factors on the QED. That's it. Okay. So this is for random graphs. Now it turns out that you can take Boas, uh, Zwicka, and so forth. You can apply alphabet reduction to it, and we can make their n times q squared theorem into an n times q theorem, uh, the same, uh, the same. Way. Okay, so now back to alphabet reduction. Right? How do we how do we do it? What is this argument to be the same predicate as yours? We need it in the alphabet reduction. Right? We need it in the so. So, so what does uh, alphabet reduction say? It says there are two functions, right, uh, that you can apply to the input, either f or g. Let's say just think about one function. But if you have many predicates, the functions will be different depending on the predicate. So it really doesn't. Uh, so we have some evidence that our technique will not apply to uh, the different predicates anyway. But again, I, I don't want to say anything more about it. So what is alphabet reduction? Um, so this really is uh, going back to a. Uh, uh, an old theorem of uh, old lemma, really, of uh, Shor and Goldreich, uh, who say that uh, you know if you think about a predicate as a matrix, as really a two-source extractor, you know, rows and columns, uh, there are subsets, there are large subsets f and b, of size at least q over two, such that if you pick the input from one subset, the row input from one subset, the column input from the other subset, uh, and evaluate the predicate on it, you have uh, you have significant bias. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, a random one. So, uh, uh, yeah, a random one would probably do. Yeah. So, sure, in Goldreich, they didn't care about the size of the subset. They only wanted sort of. So, the size of the subset translates to how many bits of entropy you have. So, really, if you have q over two size subsets, you show a sort of an impossibility of solve for two source extractors with one bit less of entropy. Sure, and Goldreich showed this for q over eight size subsets, but it really doesn't matter. You look a little deeper into the uh, closer into the theorem, you get this q over two. That's it. Okay, so what does it say? Right, it says that there is this rectangle that uh, is one half plus one over square root q uh, biased um, for any predicate. So how do I turn this into this decomposable uh, thing? Um, first of all, what do I need? I need f and g, and I need the q that uh, acts on bits to, to combine these. Things. What are f and g? F and g just say you know. 
uh, do I belong to uh, the subset S? In that case, it says one. Do I not belong to the subset S? It says zero. Same for so F acts on rows, G acts on columns. It's very simple. Yeah. And now I need the function Q that sort of takes these sort of bits, one bit, one bit, and makes it into a bit. So how do you do this? Uh, we're going to order the rectangles by how correlated they are to be. So the green sort of say they're really correlated. Half plus one over Q, one over square root Q, let's say correlated. Uh, the, the smaller green says it's less correlated. Uh, the red says it's negatively correlated, and so on and so forth. So I'm going to sort of order it by the maximum correlation. And I say, so by the way, I mean, it doesn't have to be like this, right? It could be uh, like this, you know. One of the rectangles is positively correlated to the predicate. The other three are all negatively correlated to the predicate. Could be. So what is Q of AB? It takes these two bits, right? The one bit that comes from here, one bit that comes from here. And it says, is the pair of bits in the top, is this rectangle defined by this pair of bits? in the top half of the, of the sequence. Right? So I have four rectangles. I ordered them by the correlation. If I belong to the top two rectangles, I say one. Bottom two rectangles, I say zero. Takes a little bit of work, but, it, but we can show that this composed predicate, there are no sort of funny cancellations. This guy is actually one half plus order of one over root Q correlated uh, to B. That's it. Okay, so that's that, actually. Um, so where do we go from here? Uh, that's the fun part, right? Um, you know, like I said, you know, there's a very narrow possibility that we don't manage to rule out. Neither Boaz nor us manage to rule out, uh, which is what we discussed, that, uh, you know, there's maybe a PRG where uh, the graph may be random or arbitrary, I don't really care, but each output is computed using a different predicate. In fact, even if it's sort of, even if they are random balanced predicate, I don't think we can rule it out. That is what? Random balanced predicates. They have to be balanced, obviously. So this gives you an explicit candidate? Yeah, I, I, I imagine, yeah. That I don't know how to break. But you have to remember that. But this is not enough yet. This is not enough yet because Rachel and Steph know how to work harder. <laughs> I'm going to keep saying it. <laughs> you know, it's. Okay, so that's that's one. So this is a little bit, um, a little bit, uh, a little bit annoying, um, right? You know, it's like a, it's like a murder movie. You know? It's like a murder mystery, uh, an horror movie. At the end of which, you know, you have this guy with like ten bullet shots in him, and he's like, oh. Then the last scene is he opens his eye. You know, <laughs> I don't know if this thing is dead or not. So let's maybe the CSP folks uh, in the audience let's put it out of its mystery. Three linear maps, the construction of the theorem based on three linear maps, on the other hand, is a completely different story. I think that's perfectly kosher, and uh, you know, at least the, 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 the assumption on three local PRGs, we have evidence that says that, uh, you know, that sort of at least a list of attacks that we sort of work on CSPs don't work for, for, for a certain parameter regime, which is good enough for, uh, for Rachel and Seth. So. Build three linear uh, maps, you know, is uh, is the is the open question that comes out of here. Oh, Dave. Maybe you can say explicitly what goes wrong when you have arbitrary p. When I have arbitrary p, right? So, so our 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 key technique, only technique, is this alphabet reduction, right? So we say, you know, for each input bit, I'm going to sort of project it into uh, for each input block, I'm going to project it into a bit. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Exactly. Precisely. So one can show one over q, uh, one over q correlation, which will translate translate into n q squared uh, attack with n q squared constraint, which is exactly what was. This is another way to reprove was and uh, Zwicka and others' uh, theorem. Um, so certainly, I don't know how to prove that the same SNT works for uh, for a polynomial number of, uh, of predicates. Yeah. Okay. 
So, uh, two questions, break this. Um, a slightly uh, easier question, build three linear maps. Okay. <laughs> those are the two questions. All right, thank you. Evgeny. Yeah, so um, so I think these, at least some of these constructions, the one with Rachel, uh, so the precursor to her theorem, uh, can be instantiated with approximate multilinear maps, I think, and we didn't really check it that carefully. Uh, don't want to commit. Um, so conceivably, you could have an instantiation uh, with approximate multilinear maps, but what is such a theory? So we have a theorem, right? It says uh, if DDH on these approximate multilinear maps, well, presumably, they have a theorem of that form, then the I.O. scheme is secure. But we know that for all these uh, approximate multilinear map candidates, DDH is actually false, if you have to correct me. So then the theorem doesn't make any, there is a candidate which is not broken necessarily, but the theorem doesn't make any sense. So I, I would not do it. So currently we don't have uh, an actual unbroken with a proof, with a, with a proof from a small assumption. Is this kind of this PRG term saying we don't have any candidate which syntactically works for you know three linear or whatever you know this is for small degree but it's not really working. Again, one has to be careful what you mean by candidate. Candidate with a proof from a reasonable assumption or a candidate candidate period. You mean the candidate satisfies the conclusion of the theorem but not the assumption. Of the Correct. Oh, we do it. But something which only needs like. Yes, yes, yes. So, so another way to say, you know, we're all about money, right? I mean, uh, so, uh, so you, know, you probably know that DARPA has this program that uh, you know, one of the purposes is to implement obfuscation. So there is potentially a candidate here that you could write down and implement. Uh, it's not clear that's the wisest use of, uh, am I being recorded? <laughs> I'm not going to cite that form. <laughs> That's not the case. So refused to, like, accept, you know, refused to SSD, it's not like if SSD is false, the whole thing is false, it was a particular way. In fact, that's, that, that was also the case for previous constructions, you know, the, you know. Um, right. And, but you cannot say the rules. Okay. Shai? So, trying to find another point in this range of between what you assume and what you build. Essentially, the reason you need PRGs with large stretch is to uh, instantiate randomized encoding. And presumably, the security of the PRG translates to the simulation <coughs> uh, accuracy of the randomized encoding. Uh, did anybody look at trying to directly come up with randomized encoding, you know, shove some of the assumption into the randomized encoding part? And get the randomized encoding. Look, it's randomized encoding, encoding with security where, you know. know. Where you have a representation of the seed, a short representation of the right, randomness exactly. used for. Exactly. Not to my knowledge. Not to my knowledge. Um, not to my knowledge. Uh, my question. Right.
so 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 we have proofs that uh, that say that uh, if you stretch by n to the 1.5 minus epsilon um, times polycule uh, factor, uh, then certain attacks cannot break this. For example, it's epsilon bias. It's a it's a, it's a, it's a small bias. Uh, you know. No, 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 not a random predicate. Um, it's this TSA, right? Okay, this predicate called TSA, which it's a it's, it's a predicate that here's here's it, right? I mean, it was originally a five local predicate, but you can sort of make it into a sort of three blockwise local predicate. The predicate on five bits is x1 plus x2 plus x3 plus x4 x5. Uh, you know, it has some nice properties actually, but uh, um, in fact, some very nice properties. Uh, but you can make this into a three uh, blockwise local predicate. Uh, and then we conceivably this could stretch by n to the 1.5 minus epsilon. And uh, so it's sort of. And then certain attacks don't work. Certain attacks don't work, exactly. Which is already more evidence than we have for most other. Certain attacks mean what? Uh, it's epsilon biased. It's an epsilon biased uh, generator. Uh, linear tests don't, can't distinguish from random. Um, uh, SDP-like things cannot distinguish this from random, so forth. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Thank, you. Questions. Okay. Thank you. Lunch is served outside. Should be here already. Uh, quite early. And we're going to resume at 2.30.